I feel that if any songs are going to come out of World War III, we better start writing them now. I have one here. You might call it a bit of pre-nostalgia. This is the song that some of the boys sang as they went bravely off to World War III. to drop the bomb, so don't wait up for me. But while you swelter down there in your shelter, you can see me on your TV. The songs of Tom Lehrer were the wittiest, naughtiest, slickest, maybe sickest tunes you could tap your toes to back in the late 1950s. You don't hear Tom Lehrer so much these days, partly because he keeps a rather low profile. Recently, though, he gave a rare interview to Jay Boltazor in Santa Cruz, California. That's where Lara lives and teaches half the year. I ache for the touch of your lips, dear, but much more for the touch of your whips, dear. You can raise wealth like nobody else as we dance to the masochism tango. Over the past few years, you may have heard a selection or two of Tom Lair's. His parodies on religion, politics, the military, and the American culture have attracted a small but devoted audience that today spans two generations. Comedy, though, has always been a second career for Lair, education being his first. He's taught mathematics and music at Harvard, MIT, and for the past seven years at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Lair hasn't recorded or performed publicly for 14 years, which leads some of his fans to conclude he's committed suicide. That's a comment Lair hears often these days. And occasionally, people burden him with questions about his brief entertainment career, particularly his days at Harvard in the early 1950s. People began offering me money, you know, $10 or something, to, to do a dance intermission or a party, something like that. And I, uh, it's terrific, it's their money. And uh, I was delighted to do that, and then after that, I began to get bored with that, so I made a record of the songs that I'd been singing around Harvard, around Cambridge, Massachusetts, and took the precaution of putting my address on the back of the record. It wasn't commercially distributed, and uh, the word got around, and people began writing in, and stores began carrying it, and distributors and so on, and it just began to sell. Some record companies heard about it and got interested in it and called me, and, but then as soon as they heard the record, they lost interest immediately. Because of the themes? Yeah, because of the nature of the thing, yeah. The, there's the major companies. We're all, uh, they were all, when they hear something is selling, then they're interested, but then when they heard it, they heard the songs. I don't, you know, today they so, they're so tame that it's hard to believe that anybody would have any, any uh, moral objections to them. During National Brotherhood Week, various special events are arranged to drive home the message of brotherhood. This year, for example, on the first day of the week, Malcolm X was killed, which gives you an idea of how effective the whole thing is. <laughs> I'm sure we all agree that we ought to love one another, and I know there are people in the world who do not love their fellow human beings, and I hate people like that. <laughs> Here's a song about National Brotherhood Week. Oh, the white folks hate the black folks, and the black folks hate the white folks. To hate all but the right folks is an old established rule, but during National Brotherhood Week, National Brotherhood Week, Lena Horn and Sheriff Clark are dancing cheek to cheek. It's you obviously had had uh, a background in music which somehow directed you toward these themes. I took piano lessons like everybody, and I used to play a lot of popular music, and so most of the songs, the earlier songs, were essentially takeoffs on various types of popular songs, not not parodies in the Spike Jones sense, but takeoffs of types of popular song. And uh, they dealt with issues, I suppose, but not, that wasn't the primary aim. When the shades of night are falling, comes a fellow everyone knows. It's the old dope peddler spreading joy wherever he goes every evening you will find him around our neighborhood it's the old dope peddler doing well by doing good he gives the kids free samples because he knows full well that today 
how do you see the role of, of parody or satire in the in the daily sort of experience? You, know, you grow up in an ivory tower, as I did, New York City, Harvard University. One gets the view that everybody's liberal and wonderful, and I was just expressing the views that I thought, I mean, that, that my friends, I, I wasn't saying that everybody thought that way. I know that Senator McCarthy was out there at the time, Joseph McCarthy, that is, and I like to think I see the funny side of things in the, in the parody sense. Satire is a difficult word. I don't think one can call oneself a satirist. I mean, that's something that somebody else calls you. Uh, I think of it more as, as one of the forms of parody that's the easiest is you take some form and you turn it around. They do that on Saturday Night Live, and I've done it. You, you take the basic form and then you have it apply, like the old Opella, you have it apply to something that's completely different. The contrast is then automatically has a certain humorous content. But uh, as far as uh, real satire, that's, that's, very, that's a fine line, and I don't, wasn't really attempting to do that. I think uh, the satire merges into bitterness too easily, and I don't like to do that. That's why I've never, I've never was able to think of anything funny about Watergate or Vietnam or any of that. People are always saying, oh, gee, you must have, how come you never had any songs about the Vietnam War? How come you never have any songs about Watergate? And I said, well, tell me something funny about Watergate. I never heard anything. I mean, there were, there were gags and there were little jokes, but there were, to, to address the real issues is the work of a social critic and not of a parodist. Hollywood's often tried to mix show business with politics from Helen Gehagen to Ronald Reagan, but Mr. Murphy is the star who's done the best by far. Oh, gee, it's great. At last we've got a senator who can really sing and dance. Politics and current events have long been the staple for countless entertainers. For Tom Lair, those same topics were a means to parody the American experience with music and verse. In 1965, he produced That Was the Year That Was, an album containing his amusing takeoffs written for the popular television program That Was the Week That Was. Who knows, 50 years hence, Tom Lair's songs may be required listening in a college history course. What does Lair think about that? I think that uh, the specific references aren't as important. It is, uh, I teach a musical comedy course out here in Santa Cruz, and, and we do Of the I Sing fairly often, and the references there are definitely dated. It has to do with 1931. But the, once you get those small uh, references cleared out, that is, who Calvin Coolidge was, you can get the joke. And I think the same thing might be true. The, the type of humor, I would have thought, would have been dated. I mean, that is what surprises me about the, the songs that came out in 1953 that I did on my first record was that the level of humor was what used to be called sophomoric. And that, be, that was a, a pejorative then and became a term of phrase later on, but uh, in some circles. Um, that I, I thought that was just kind of you know, college humor, you know, just uh, making fun of, of anything. And uh, what has amazed me is the fact that, the, that it's selling at all. Now, after all these years, that some of these dated references, I'm sure the people who are buying the records now have no idea uh, what it means, but I, um, that doesn't matter. I, it's both like Shakespeare, I suppose. You don't understand what every word means, but you get the whole... I like to, to compare myself with Shakespeare. You see. <laughs> Another big news story of the year concerned the ecumenical council in Rome known as Vatican II. <laughs> Among the things they did in an attempt to make the church more commercial <laughs> was to introduce the vernacular into portions of the Mass to replace Latin and to widen somewhat the range of music permissible in the liturgy. But I feel that if they really want to sell the product in, uh, in this secular age, what they ought to do is to redo some of the liturgical music in popular song forms. I have a modest example here. <laughs> it's called The Vatican Rag. <laughs> Genuflect, genuflect. Do whatever steps you want if you have cleared them with the pontiff. Everybody say his own, Kyrie eleison, doing the Vatican right. That interview with Tom Lehrer by Jay Baldazar, he taped it in Santa Cruz, California. 
This is NPR, National Public Radio.